When a sound plays, it may be that we want to look at particular frequencies of that sound in order to affect parameters in the game. A good example of this would be for a camera shake effect. A camera shake would be in response to a powerful low frequency that actually makes things move. So in using a sound to trigger this, we just want to look at the low frequency elements of that sound, ignoring the high frequency elements. If we go to bookmark key 5 in the demonstration level and then turn and look back across the river, we can see a circle of mushrooms on the ground. Playing the game from here, we can press the key P to launch a magic spell. We've looked at how these particles can react to the envelope of that sound in the last video. In this video we're going to look at how we can analyse the frequency spectrum of the sound to create a camera shake effect. We're going to base the camera shake on the impact sound of the spell. So if we open up this blueprint, which is the listener distance system, you can see that this just fires off another blueprint called the BPDC Noisemaker. And within that we can find our sound. Magic Bolt Particle React Impact. You can see that the final sound of this sound cue is a combination of several different sounds that are mixed together. The first thing we need to do is to choose what audio frequency we're going to use to determine the camera shake effect. I've rendered out a version of the sound produced by that sound cue in order to do some spectral analysis. So I'm just going to loop this initial part of the magic bolt. In my EQ, I'm going to add a bandpass filter and tighten up the Q so that I can pick the frequency range that I feel is appropriate to trigger a camera shake. That kind of low end thump is what we want to really trigger the camera shake from. So that's about 80 hertz. Just like the non real time envelope analysis, the frequency analysis is enabled within the individual sound waves. So we'll select them all and we'll sync to browser and then we'll bulk edit them. We're going to expand the analysis options and enable Baked FFT Analysis. FFT stands for Fast Fourier Transform, which is a method that can be used to identify the frequency components in a signal. The FFT size is the size of the FFT window that is used for the analysis. Ideally, you'd allow for four complete periods of a given frequency to get accurate analysis. So for example, if you wanted to analyze a sound at 100 Hz, its period is 10 milliseconds. And at a sample rate of 48 kilohertz, you'd need to look at 480 samples in order to get that 10 milliseconds. And to get four complete periods, you'd need to analyze four times 480, so that's 1920 samples. The easiest way to think about this is that if you want your analysis to be accurate for high frequency sounds, then use a smaller FFT size. And if you want it to be more accurate for lower frequency sounds, then use a larger one. In this case, we'll go for 1024. We've discussed frame size in a previous video, but basically this allows us to group together a given number of audio frames or samples and to get the average value across that group. The smaller the grouping of samples, the more accurate, but the greater the data required. The attack and release times is the time in milliseconds it takes the spectral envelope follower to respond to increasing or decreasing magnitudes. So in our frequencies to analyze, Let's choose 80 Hertz and let's also choose 8000 just for illustration. We'll start by creating a custom event called Camera Shake. And we want to trigger this while the sound is playing so we can track the magnitude of frequencies over time. So we'll do that here from the on audio playback percent node. We'll get a reference to our sound and we'll drag out will get cooked FFT data. We need to instruct this node with what frequencies we want it to get. So we'll drag out from there, promote that to a variable, compile, and we'll add two sets of frequencies we want to get, which is the 80 and 8000. 
Now, since we're typically looking for several frequencies, what we're going to get out of here is an array of sound wave spectral data structs or structures. You'll remember from previous videos that structs are a special type of variable that allow us to hold a collection of different types of data. In this instance, each struct contains the frequency of the spectrum value, its magnitude and its normalized magnitude. So we'll read through that array of structs with a for each loop. And then we'll break the result. And then we'll print string to make sure that we're getting the values that we think we should be. So let's look first at the frequencies that we're getting out. Okay, so you can see every tick we're getting the cooked FFT data from that audio component for both of the frequencies that we specified here, 80 and 8000. And then if we swap that over, we can see the kind of magnitudes we're getting. So you can see there are two sort of groups of numbers. We're obviously getting quite large magnitudes for one of those frequency ranges and much less for the other. Now what we're interested in initially is what's going on 80 hertz in order to control the camera effect. So at this point, let's create a branch coming off a float equals float so that we can check and just look at the 80 hertz result. So when we go through this array, if we get a struct that is associated with the frequency 80 hertz, then we'll read the string and see the magnitude that we're getting. And out of interest, we could add another one here, which looks at the 8000 hertz frequency. And if we know that it's not the 80, then we could come off this false here and create another branch. Just double check that it is the 8000 hertz that we're looking at. And then if we feed that into our print string, we'll just get the magnitudes when we're looking at the 8000 hertz frequency. As you can see, those are significantly lower than the 80 hertz frequency and that's what we might expect having done that spectral analysis of the sound itself. So now let's get rid of those things just to keep, keep it tidy. Within the first person character blueprint, you can see our camera shake system. It's essentially a specialized type of animation that acts on the camera. You can see that this is triggered by a custom event called play camera shake and that this custom event has a float input called scale, which we can use to scale the amount of camera shake. If we get player character and cast to the first person character, we can trigger that camera shake event, which was called play camera shake. We'll set the scale to one for the time being. We'll come back to that in a moment. Now we want this camera shake to only occur when the 80 hertz frequency is above a given magnitude. And looking at the range of values we saw a moment ago, we're going to trigger this if the magnitude is greater than 20. So I'll find a greater than float node here. So if the magnitude of the 80 hertz frequency is greater than 20, we'll add another branch node here. And we'll use that to trigger that camera shake. So let's just go over that again. Each frame, we're getting the frequencies that we identified in the FFT analysis of the sounds. We get an array containing those two packets of information or structs. We read through each of those elements and break them in order to get the current frequency, magnitude and normalized magnitude. Each time we test that element against 80 Hertz, and if it's true that it's that 80 hertz element we're looking at, we then test it again to see if the magnitude of that frequency is greater than 20. And if that's true, 
we then trigger the camera shake. So there we can see we had our camera shake. Now, rather than just playing the camera shake whenever you hear a sound, the advantage of using frequency analysis is that the sound itself may often be changing. We can use these changes to determine whether or not something happens. Since the Get Cooked FFT data node gives us the average magnitude for the frequency across all of the currently playing sound waves, it will reflect the nature of the combined sound that we're hearing. So for example, in our Magic Bolt Particle React Impact sound, most of the energy for that 80 Hz magnitude is coming from this thump sound. Now if we altered this to add a random node so that sometimes that thump played and sometimes it didn't, we can see the effect that's going to have on the camera shake. So on that occasion, that thump sound played, therefore the 80 Hz frequency was above that magnitude of 20. But on that occasion, because we didn't have that element in the sound, the 80 Hz frequency wasn't above 20 and therefore we didn't get a camera shake. We'll just put that back. The system is getting the average magnitude for the frequency across all the currently playing sounds in the sound queue, as we just discussed. What it's not doing is taking into account the actual amplitude of the sound queue as heard by the player in the level. What we might want to do is to vary the camera shake according to how far away the player is from the sound that's occurring. We're going to start by getting the distance between the player and the sound. The sound belongs to this noisemaker blueprint, so we'll get a reference to self, and we'll get distance 2. Now what we want to base this scaling system on is the actual attenuation of the sound wave itself. Up here you can see that we're actually getting the attenuations from the sound itself and we're assigning them to this variable called noise attenuation settings. So let's get a reference to that and break it. You might remember from looking at attenuations before that the extents describe the inner area of the sound when it's at its maximum volume. So we want to get the extents distance and take this away from this distance between the player and the sound, so float minus float, so that this fake attenuation over distance that's controlling the camera shake doesn't actually start until we're outside of that extents distance. So we'll find the extents. This is actually a vector, so we'll break that. And we only actually need the x value because our sound is a sphere. So now the distance from the player to the extents of the sound is going to be our value. This is going to go from zero when the sound is right up against the player to our sound's fall off distance when the sound is far away. So let's create a map range, clamped, feed our changing distance into this value and get the fall off distance here and that's our range B. Now to control the camera shake we actually want to invert that relationship so that when the sound is far away we have no camera shake and when we're right up against those inner extents of the sounds, in other words the sound is at its loudest, then the camera shake is at its maximum. So the in range goes from zero to our fall off distance which is about 4000 for this particular sound and we're going to invert that to give us a number between 1 and 0. Then we'll send that to scale the amount of camera shake that we get. So when the sound is coming from quite far away, we get a little camera shake like that. So that must be right on the fall off. That was just beyond the fall off of the distance of the sound itself there. And we're just within it then. So we got a little camera shake. And as we get closer, the camera shake is scaled and so it's more extreme. In this video we've seen how we can determine a number of frequencies to be analysed offline or cooked. This makes it efficient to look at this data during gameplay rather than trying to analyse it live. 
but we need to remember that it will not take into account any real-time changes to the sound, for example its playback volume, or changes as a result of any effects that might be applied. We'll be looking at real-time analysis in a later video.